I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco and for Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, bundle up. Apple considers bundling its paid digital services as soon as 2020 will have details. Plus standoff simmers. Alibaba co-founder Jack Ma says the U.S. and China risk 20 more years of trade tensions. We'll hear part of his exclusive interview with Bloomberg News. And cooks in the kitchen will look at the now competitive space of rental kitchens. A few former Uber employees tell us about their new startup called Virtual Kitchen. But first, our top story. So Apple is considering bundling its paid digital services, including News Plus, Apple TV Plus, and Apple Music. As soon as 2020, this is all according to sources. This is seen as a bid to gain more subscribers. The tech giant is already experimenting with this kind of approach, offering free Apple TV Plus subscription to student users of Apple Music. Joining us to discuss, it is Bloomberg's Mark Gurman in Los Angeles. So Mark, walk me through what are we bundling and why? Yeah, thank you for having me. I mean, it's like you said, it's what Apple wants to do is they want to bundle together their different paid services. They've had Apple Music since 2015. They came out with four or five new ones across, you know, 2019 this year. So now they want to make it cheaper and more affordable to be able to subscribe to them by lowering the price if you subscribe to multiple. So, for example, right now, Apple Music costs $10. News Plus costs $10. iCloud Storage, I pay $3 a month for you know, 200 gigabyte. Uh, there's Apple Arcade for $5. There's Apple TV Plus for $5. So altogether, that's about $40, $50 if you add it up, depending on how much storage you have. Imagine being able to get everything for maybe a $5 to $10 discount per month. That's what a bundle will do. That will get more people locked into the Apple ecosystem, and it'll generate more recurring revenue for Apple because people will want to subscribe to additional services because they're going to be saving some money by doing so. So I get that, except that we learned within cable and the TV business that consumers and millennials are in the unbundling era. So why does Apple appear to be going against the grain? Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, the unbundling era definitely is a thing where people are subscribing to a bunch of services from different companies. But the thing here is, is that all of Apple services, they play together, they interact with each other, they're all available from the phone. These are all coming from one specific company. So it's a little bit different in this case. So, Mark, the timing of your reporting is not suspect. It comes a few days after Disney's Plus incredible launch, uh, uh, quite a success from them. Does this appear that Apple and at least the Apple TV Plus side is playing catch up, maybe got caught on their heels a little bit with the big success of Disney's streaming service? No, I don't think it's related uh, much, actually. I think that this is something they've been working on and considering for at least a year or two. They knew they'd be coming out with these services, and you know it's only a matter of time before they bundle them together. Uh, the interesting new thing in our report today is that the Apple TV, or I should say the Apple News Plus agreements between Apple and publishers signed around March, April of 2019, so about six months ago. They include a clause that allows Apple to have the right to bundle Apple News Plus with additional services. So that's your first hard evidence that this is something Apple's going to do, and that's what our story is all about. And what that clause says is Apple would be giving a smaller share of the News Plus cut to these publishers if uh, they do indeed bundle it, which makes sense. There's going to be less money coming into Apple because it's going to be at a cheaper rate because of the bundle with other services. So of course Apple will also be giving a little bit less of that slice of revenue to publishers as well. So then what are publishers and advertisers saying? Because this is actually one of the instances where there isn't targeted advertising, that this may not be as beneficial as the targeted advertising is, say, a Google or a Facebook. Yeah, I mean, Apple in general, their, their privacy mantra is very strong, and they're not going to allow publishers or other third parties that they work with on these subscription services to do any sort of data mining and get information on their users. So that's something that doesn't happen, and that's something that's pretty much never going to happen uh, with the current Apple. I don't imagine that ever changing, no matter who is in charge of the company. It's something so core to them, uh, as, as it seems so far, and they've really been leveraging it in terms of their marketing campaign. Uh, by the way, the last year or so too. In terms of News Plus and advertisers and publishers, News Plus has been 
pretty much a failure compared to many of their other services. Uh, they've had 200,000 subscribers on day one. They haven't had many since then. Uh, this thing is not something that a lot of people are subscribing to. Personally, I've noticed that they've been upping their marketing for News Plus on their website, uh, on Twitter as well, and other social media. So it seems like something they're dedicated to and, and they're planning on turning around. But it has not been the success that I think they may have been expecting when it was announced back in March. And if you think about the price, you know, $10 is not a lot for what you have access to. Uh, but, you know, it's a lot compared to some of their other services, right? That's the same as Apple Music and double the price of Apple Arcade uh, and double the price of Apple TV Plus if you are indeed paying for it. So $10 could be a lot uh, for a lot of people for that. And it'll be interesting to see if they intend to cut the price on News Plus eventually to, to up their subscriber base for that product or if they're going to really just rely on the bundles to push that service. All things Apple and boosting that services revenue, that is Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. And switching from Apple to another big tech company, it's Uber. New Jersey just hit Uber with a whopping $650 million employment tax bill. The state says the ride-sharing company has been misclassifying drivers as independent contractors. New Jersey considers them employees, and it wants unemployment and disability insurance taxes paid. To further explain, we are joined by Bloomberg Technologies' Eric Newcomer. Eric, who's right? Where's the disconnect here? You know, this independent contractor issue was a huge risk factor in the risk factors when Uber went public this year. And, you know, the legal system is just so slow to play out when we think about the life cycles of these companies. You know, Uber, it feels like it took forever to go public. And the idea that the independent contractor issue still wasn't resolved is sort of shocking. But that that's the reality. You know, California passed a law that makes it more, much more likely that Uber drivers could lose their independent contractor status. Now we have this New Jersey fine. So this is a very live issue and is just a big threat for Uber's business model. Eric, you correctly brought up California as well. So New Jersey, California, what other states are looking at this? You know, it, it's hard to count them all because it's one of those situations where there can be a legal challenge, so you have all these court cases that have played out. Uber's tried to force those into arbitration. And then you also have, you know, states can set their own labor rules. And so, you know, even a state like Massachusetts had the same ABC test that was then sort of taken over to California. You know, there's a lot of legal wonkery here, but, but the point is that every state can look at this, and so that's why it remains a big threat to Uber. Eric, another big story that we're following when it comes to Uber is uh, former CEO founder Travis Kalanick selling now about $711 million of his shares. Are investors nervous that he's selling out? You know, I, I think savvy investors would expect it. I mean, Kalanick's been basically pushed aside. He remains on the board, but this isn't his company. You know, it's very much been a turnaround story, and he's building, you know, a, a sort of adjacency company in Cloud Kitchen. So I, I think it's not surprising that he'd want to ca cash out. He'd already sold some shares to SoftBank. So I, I don't think it's that surprising. But any selling is obviously a negative signal to Uber, even when there's a logic to it. Eric, when do we expect large institutional long term investors to come in and stabilize the sell off of this stock? You know, I think as long as people are worried that. It's going to that the losses will drag down the top line, you know, until Uber can convince people that it can operate profit profitably and continue to grow the market. If investors are worried that the story that the ride sharing just isn't that much exponentially bigger than sort of the existing transportation, you know, taxi industry without the subsidies, that's going to worry people. So I think as long as you have that business model risk, in, in sort of the size of it, coupled with stuff like independent contractors, and then SoftBank's sort of portfolio doing badly, poorly generally, I think you know, people are going to be worried. Bloomberg Technologies, Eric Newcomer, thank you for thank joining you. us.
Now another big tech story late Thursday we got a glimpse into where some of the world's wealthiest investors are moving their money and that includes those big tech companies. With more on those 13 F filings I want to bring in Bloomberg's Shanali Bosick. Shanali what did we learn about who's buying and who's selling technology? Certainly Taylor we definitely have a flood of information coming in and it'll be really exciting tomorrow to look at it all in aggregate. So something that came out of the second quarter that we knew for example was that Uber was actually the most bought company despite the slump. However, it's actually slumped a lot more since then. As you know, Travis Kalanick himself has been selling, but you, we, who did we have buy into it? We had a lot of the Tiger Cubs, so Tiger Clo Global, Co2. Tiger Global is also known for its private market bets as well, remember, and we also had them buy into this quarter, Slack and Beyond Meat, so more kind of um, more IPO companies for this year. Who else do we have that's kind of a hot stock? Uh, Harvard Management is f uh, flowing into Facebook as well as Tiger Global, so we see some activity there. People seem a little bit mixed on Apple and um, uh, and Google. Warren Buffett had trimmed down on Apple just a tiny bit, nothing to be super alarmed by, but uh, Alphabet itself, I would love to see what all these numbers look like in aggregate because it does seem like these big hedge fund managers have a very mixed view on what the value of that is. Well, Shanali, I like that you brought in Warren Buffett because when he originally bought into Apple, we were all a little bit surprised given it was a tech company and it's not a traditional value company. What do we know about his stake in Apple and where it now stands after he trimmed that a bit? He, he trimmed it a very little bit. Honestly, it's still very, very large. Um, you know, you had mentioned his, uh, oh, he usually tries to stay away from big tech companies he doesn't understand. But as we see, his stock pickers have been warming up to more of them, including Amazon, um, which you wish he had bought much earlier. So it's not a huge surprise. Buffett himself has been holding on to more and more cash and kind of reducing his equity exposure overall relative to that. And so, again, not super surprising. Uh, they, they reduced on Wells Fargo, actually. So his kind of change in stance on the banking sector was a little more surprising than what we saw with him in tech. One of our favorites, it is 13F filing day in Bloomberg's Shanali Bosick all over that story. Thanks for joining. And coming up, Google is changing its advertising technology to better protect people's privacy. But will it be enough? We discuss next. This is Bloomberg. The iconic Motorola Razr is back, but not how you remember it. Motorola is rebooting its Razr flip phone as a 6.2 inch smartphone with a foldable display. The company executives say they are confident in Razr's durability despite competitors' struggles compared to Samsung's Galaxy Fold and Huawei's Mate X. The new Razr is the most affordable model in this category. It is set to become the first true foldable phone on the market as other devices so far are more like foldable tablets. The phone costs $1,500 and will be available for pre-order in December, arriving in stores in January. Now, Google said it would make changes to its advertising technology to better protect people's privacy. That follows scrutiny by European Union watchdogs. Starting in February, Google will no longer divulge information to participants in its ad auction about the type of content on a website or page where an ad could appear. To discuss this and all of the other big tech privacy concerns, we're joined by Yelp, Senior Vice President of Public Privacy and Government Relations, Luther Lowe's. So let's first talk about the EU. They've been more strict than the U.S. when it comes to data privacy. What are some of the lessons, the takeaways that the U.S. can glean from the EU? Yeah, I think that the uh, this recent action that we saw today uh, just shows that Google can always play a little bit of a shell game when uh, there's pressure from governments on them to try to dodge scrutiny. And the major scrutiny that has happened in Europe over the last few years was this antitrust ruling against Google. And we're now seeing in the United States lots of new antitrust activity uh, to try to catch up with Europe. So. Uh, for example, I, I read some news today that the, uh, the state attorneys general have actually uh, expanded their investigation beyond uh, simply advertising technology, which is what the EU was uh, in response to the Google News uh, today, and expanding into search in Android. And so uh, I don't think you can have two giant markets like the EU and the U.S. out of sync for very long, and that's why you're seeing the U.S. really play catch up on these antitrust issues. So you're at Yelp. Why take on Google? Yeah. Well, you know, when a mom does a search for a pediatrician today on Google, rather than 
being matched with the best information from across the web. Today, she gets siphoned into this low quality corpus of information that Google has collected. It doesn't go through the same type of vetting. And really, this is not good for the mom. It's not good for uh, competition on the web. The only kind of entity it's good for is Google. Uh, they've begun to sort of put their hand on the scale uh, to try to protect their dominance in general search. And it's starting to harm consumers. So Yelp is involved in these issues because, uh, number one, it's, it's competitive. That Google, you know, is by putting its hand on the scale, creates a competitive threat. But ultimately, it's about consumers. Local searching is the most common thing we do on Google. And has that negatively impacted your business at Yelp? I mean, uh, you know, Yelp, I'm proud to say, has been able to, to weather the storm uh, fairly well. Uh, and we try to, uh, you know, uh, fight uh, to have another day it kind of in spite of this, not, uh, you know, and we are, I, I think, in, in good shape. And I wouldn't have worked here for, for 12 years if I weren't optimistic about the business. But it's not even necessarily about Yelp v. Google. It's about the fact that there are so many companies uh, and innovators that are uh, sort of being deprived of the ability to create new businesses on the web uh, because of Google's behavior. What about all the other big tech companies? Facebook, Amazon, are they as big a threat? You know, it's a great question. I, I don't think as much about uh, Facebook and Amazon because I, I w I'll say personally I'm somewhat less offended by Facebook and Amazon because I think they are, they kind of, they're portals in and of themselves. They're walled gardens, whereas Google, when it launched, it presented itself as a turnstile. They said, come to Google, we're going to match you with the best info across, from across the web, and we're going to send you on to the internet. And it's really hard to decouple the rise of Google from the rise of what uh, the term Tim O'Reilly popularized, Web 2.0, uh, user-generated content services, social media services. Google was instrumental in kind of unlocking all this cool innovation on the internet. And we now know through recent independent research that the majority of traffic going to Google today is actually terminating on Google or going to Google secondary pages. So they've kind of done a 180 in their, uh, in their business model. What are you doing at Yelp to keep customer data privacy safe? Well, the good news about vertical search services, Yelp is considered sort of vertical specialized search engine, uh, is that you don't have to have a ton of creepy info about a user to serve up a relevant ad. So, uh, you know, if I'm doing a search for a dentist in San Diego, Yelp doesn't need to know, uh, you know, where that person lives, a ton of info about that individual. They just need to go to the San Diego bucket and the dentist sub bucket to fish out a relevant ad. And I think that's actually one of the advantages of having robust competition on the web is that you can have uh, smaller competitors, a more pluralistic web where uh, people can optimize for privacy and do better by consumers. But if you're putting all the, hand, all the power into the hands of you know, one or two companies, uh, you are going to uh, trigger these types of privacy concerns. Yelps, Luther Lowe, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And coming up, former Uber employees are taking on former CEO Travis Kalanick in a battle of cloud kitchens. We bring you the story next. This is Bloomberg. A few former Uber employees have created a new startup, Virtual Kitchen. It's one of many entrants into the crowded field of companies renting kitchen space to restaurants desperate to satisfy demand from hungry homebodies. But it's particularly noteworthy that the founders came from Uber. Travis Kalanick, he's Uber's co-founder and former chief executive officer, runs a competing business, and Uber itself piloted a cloud kitchen, creating tension between Uber's former and current CEOs last year. Joining us to discuss the space. It is Ken Chong. He's the CEO of Virtual Kitchens. Ken, great to have you. As we know, hugely crowded space. How do you stand out? Thank you, Taylor. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, food delivery is, is really popular. Uh, consumers continue to love the, the convenience of it. And we talk to a lot of restaurateurs, and it turns out it's actually very challenged for restaurants who are built for dine-in first with a lot of seating. And so with Virtual Kitchen, we really are trying to make it seamless and turnkey for restaurateurs to expand delivery uh, in a very simple way at, with very little upfront costs. And of course, bring more selection and great food to more customers. And you left Uber and, and, and Uber Eats in part because you saw the, the strain that the delivery apps were putting on those restaurants. How are you solving for that strain with your new Virtual Kitchen? Absolutely. So. 
restaurants are really built for dine-in first, and the food mm -hmm. menu packaging is really built for dine-in, um, including how they use the real estate. Uh, it turns out for delivery, there are a set of whole new challenges, similar to what brick and mortar retail saw about 10 years ago, you know, switching from uh, sort of walk-in and shopping malls to online. And so we build uh, space operations and offer help on staffing, menu, and, and site selection to help them do the best delivery um, sort of product possible, bringing it really close to customers. Every analyst on the street talks about how capital intensive this business is. Can you give us a sense of how much cash you're burning through to get through the first few years? Absolutely. Um, we've taken an, a very asset light approach. We think there are, it's a massive space with a, tot a ton of uh, problems to be solved from real estate to operations to technology. Um, and you have some companies focusing just on the staffing aspect of it. Um, we've decided to be very asset light and really focus on picking the best sites, leasing them, and building them out to be the most seamless for delivery um, and the most plug and play for top restaurant brands. You work with a lot of partners. Uh, Uber Eats is one of them. How is that relationship? Um, so the delivery apps are really popular and they have a lot of um, drivers and, 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 and couriers available already to help do the delivery. So we work with them and they do the delivery part of it. It's really plug and play. Um, and you know, I think this is one of those rare situations where it's win, win, win all around. It's great for restaurants to expand seamlessly. Um, it brings great high quality food to customers um, and, and in a very fast way. And for the delivery apps, it's about expanding the selection and really delivering a, a, the best experience possible to their customers. How are you using data to forecast demand ahead of time so kitchens know how much and what to prepare? Yes, so you know, drawing on my experience at Uber uh, Marketplace, there's there's sort of demand patterns, and you can really use software to figure out um, how to plan inventory, how to take into account holidays and weekend patterns, and we want to make that available for restaurant businesses um, so that they can better plan inventory and better serve their customers. Do customers really care where their food is made? I don't think so. Um, I think really what customers care about is the the, the high quality product and the and the taste of the food. Um, we really try to put our locations as close to customers as possible, um, and in turn they get high quality, warm, fresher foods in a really fast time. Quickly here, about 20 seconds. What was your biggest lesson that you took away from Uber that you're now applying? We try to be um, restaurateur and customer first. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to restaurants to understand how their business have shift, uh, shifted to delivery. In some cases, they've told me that five years ago it was about 10% delivery and now in some cases they're seeing about 60 percent and so that shift has been very dramatic and they are, they didn't really set up their business necessarily for that so we're here to help them and listen the world of shared kitchens that was virtual kitchen ceo ken chong thank you for joining us thank you Jill. and coming up using ai to fix trouble tickets we speak to the ceo of moveworks and their investor at kleiner perkins that is next this is bloomberg Technology. I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. Using AI to wrap up help desk trouble tickets. That's the mission of MoveWorks. The startup founded in 2016 just closed a $75 million Series B funding round led by Kleiner Perkins, Iconic Capital, and Sapphire Ventures. That brings their total raise to $105 million. MoveWorks counts LinkedIn, Symantec, Broadcom, Western Digital, and more as part of its user base. Joining us to discuss, none other than MoveWorks CEO and co-founder, Bob and Shaw, and Kleiner Perkins partner, Mahmoud Hamid. Great to have you both. And let me start with you. Describe what the company is and what you want to use the funding for. Yeah, Taylor, well, thanks for having us here. It's great to be here. Um, MoveWorks is a machine learning platform that uses natural language to understand and resolve support tickets that are submitted by employees of large companies. So let me give you a, a couple examples. Right now, we're resolving about 35% percent of all tickets that come into some of those companies you just mentioned, uh, Broadcom, uh, Nutanix, Western Digital, uh, Align Technologies, etc. And the way that it works is, you know, the three of us are knowledge workers. And knowledge workers all over the planet are submitting about one ticket a month to their IT teams. Those tickets involve things like 
Can I get access to a new application? Can you add me to this distribution list? Can you remove me from this distribution list? Can you give me some troubleshooting help? And so what our system does is takes all that language that we write in those emails, understands it, interprets it, and then actually does the entire job of resolving it end to end. Because industry-wide today, the average time to resolve those tickets is three days. That's so crazy. we're bringing that down to three seconds. So I mean, thousands of, com of companies out there that try to solve problem using AI and data and software. What did you see uh, specifically about this company that you liked as an investor? Yeah, so uh, MoveWorks is a phenomenal company. Uh, it's really taking a uh, leadership position in the IT support automation space. Uh, just an area that we've been intrigued by, just the use of machines and AI in solving uh, natural langu language problems. And uh, it, what makes MoveWorks really special is the what's under the hood with the natural language processing, the AI, the ML, the semantic search, a lot of buzzwords, but a lot of real work that the company has done to actually build something that uh, customers use to solve problems. And I think Bala mentioned up to 35% of tickets are autonomously resolved inside of these companies without any human interaction. Well, that was really surprising to me because a lot of your clients, you count them as tech companies. So you think that they would be good at solving some of these tech related problems. Why are they outsourcing that to you instead of bringing that on board themselves? Yeah, it's a good question. So when we started, we decided that instead of making machine learning our customers' problems, mm -hmm. we would make it our job. And so um, what we do is we actually build these models, we train these models, we annotate the data, we retrain, we come up with new algorithmic designs, and we'll deploy continuously because at scale, across all these customers, we're actually able to learn very rapidly the types of issues and what's needed to resolve them. And so every new customer that comes on board, there's actually a network effect where we can actually be better, more precise, and more accurate in that resolution because we're serving so many customers, where if one customer did it themselves, they would sort of be limited to their own data. So beyond these tickets, what did you see within AI specifically that you see future opportunities? Yeah, so, so today we're uh, solving these IT issues, but what's under the hood really applies to uh, way beyond that, to, to uh, tickets around, you know, hey, what's the uh, vacation schedule look like for my company? Uh, how much can I contribute to my 401k? So HR-related issues, finance-related issues. So, so the syntax applied to IT tickets, HR, to finance, different. But you can apply the, what's under the hood at, at MoveWorks to a variety of applications that uh, ranges across the enterprise, not just IT-specific workflows, workflows. So I think what we liked was the extensibility of the platform to beyond IT itself. In the last year, how much more focus have you put on profitability and expenses given some of the more high-profile names that we've talked about that haven't done well on the profitability front? It's a topic of conversation at every board meeting, and uh, you know, uh, you know, we tend to invest in software businesses where the gross margins are in the 80 to 90 percent, and uh, which is the case with MoveWorks. And so, you know, naturally, you expect these companies to have to raise less capital than companies that you know deploy physical assets uh, or buy physical buildings. Uh, so, very different than a lot of the companies that we invest in, which have high gross margin businesses. And what has been the most asked question from the investor to you in the last year? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, this process of raising this new round was actually something that uh, was precipitated by the investors. Um, you know, a lot of what we've been focused on and the key metric that we care about is how do we resolve more tickets for our customers? And those customers have been getting that value. And so the investors have actually been hearing from customers that this is actually one of the few AI initiatives that they've rolled out that has actually delivered that promise that all people talk about AI being able to do. So that's kind of how we've been oriented in terms of what to focus on. And, you know, and, and I think for us, we've been fortunate that there is one metric that matters. Every morning I wake up and I look at a dashboard and it tells me how many tickets did we resolve at Broadcom? How many tickets did we resolve mm -hmm. at Nutanix? And that clarity of purpose and that clarity of what we're supposed to do for each customer is really the conversation we have with investors. Because if we can do this at a global scale across all companies, because every company in the world has an IT department, then we actually have a real opportunity to build a sustainable business. Mom, and final, final question to you. Within the software space, as you take a look at the private company landscape, how overvalued does it feel? Well, there are, I think, uh, last count, over 400 companies that are valued at a billion or more, uh, combined valuation of uh, over a trillion dollars. 
Uh, so, you know, the, the beauty of our markets is that once companies are private for long enough, they go public. Mm -hmm. And the public market typically values them the way public market investors look at companies on, on a P&L, on a profitability basis. So uh, look, at some point, it all catches up. You know, I think uh, the, 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 the source of truth ends up being the public markets. And I think, you know, uh, we found that uh, these private companies find their, their, their sort of like their median uh, valuation or their the right valuation in the public markets eventually and so you know the truth will c comes out eventually uh, whether it's on the private market sometimes or the public markets. are the public markets smarter than the private markets uh, I think the public markets have uh, value companies a certain way and based on very defined metrics mm -hmm. uh, that are very public and mm -hmm. uh, re uh, released every on a quarterly basis <laughs> so uh, that is that is you know it perfect, but sometimes also imperfect. Mm -hmm. Bob and Shaw of MoveWorks and Mamoon Hamid of Kleiner Perkins, thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Alibaba co-founder Jack Ma says that trade tensions between the U.S. and China could last 20 years if the two superpowers aren't careful. He sat down for an exclusive interview with Bloomberg in the Western African country of Togo. Well, if we do not hand a candle carefully, I mean, not the trade war might be I say USA and China relationship might be in, you know, in, in, in some turbulence in 20 years, next 20 years may last. We have to be very, very careful. I think it's so important for China and the USA, two great countries to working together, the supporting economy, keep people prosperity, share a lot of technology together, and uh, for so many years, China and U.S. have been working together. There is a problem. That's very natural. If there's no problem, that's not natural, right? So when the problems, we have to solve the problems, we should not create more problems. And you've said that you love Africa, and um, you've, been, you've acted a bit as a bridge between China and Africa. What do you see as the main thing that China can gain from Africa and vice versa, the main thing that Africa can gain from China? Well, um, I love Africa since three years ago, my first trip. I read a lot of things about Africa. I thought I knew, but I came here and said, no, this is not. And I was inspired by the people, young people, so many young people, and I inspired the the origin of the cultures. Um, I decide that I come every year, at least to three, four countries, and I fit, I try to visit every country in 10 years. And uh, I would not say that uh, how China can help Africa, or how Africa can benefit from China, but I come as a global citizen, as an entrepreneur, as entrepreneur been working in the world for 20 years, I think a lot of our experience, our ideas, our know-how could enable and help African young people. And meanwhile, these years I start to think, how can China help in a, in a more efficient way? China putting a lot of efforts in Africa. When I was very young, I heard a lot of doctors in my hometown, they have to go to Africa for a year to help. But I think today, China and Africa, there are a lot of things, similarity. Africa can learn a lot from, F from China on how China developed in the past 20 years in such a quick way, how we lift the poverty out of that. Is there still a plan to list and financial? Some they will, but don't, we are not in a hurry. We don't have a, a plan for that yet in the short term because, you know, at financing, first, we are very profitable. We grow very healthy. And I think we have a lot of things we want to do uh, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in, in these years to making sure that we have enough investment for the future. And if you did list, do you know what exchange you would be looking at? We, we, just like I say, we're not thinking about when to marry, so we will not think about where to marry yet. That was Alibaba co-founder Jack Ma. 
Coming up, the tech job market is tight and most large U.S. companies are competing to fill many of those same roles. How cutthroat is it? We'll explore. This is Bloomberg. As demand for tech workers grow, companies continue to sweeten their benefit packages, but that is still not enough to fill the vacancies as employers compete for talent in a tight labor market. For this week's Work Shifting segment, we're joined by Hired CEO to discuss the need for more tech recruitment. Hired is a marketplace that matches candidates with tech companies worldwide, and we are joined by Hired CEO Mahul Patel. So thank you for joining us. And I am shocked to hear this with all of the salaries and the benefits benefits that you hear about, why are these jobs not being filled more quickly? Yeah, so the thing to realize is every company is now a tech company. So it used to be just tech companies hired tech talent. Every company now, Disney just launched Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. You've got Capital One, American Express, everyone's creating apps. So they all need tech talent. So demand for tech talent is just exploding, right? So a 32% increase in tech jobs over the last year. But the tech supply, people with the tech skills is relatively flat. So we just got to demand supply imbalance that's driving the market. So what do you do to solve for that imbalance? Well, I mean, some of the things that matter to candidates haven't changed, right? So what is my compensation? How do I grow at this company? Why is this culture a good fit for me? Um, but you've also got to pay um, and understand total compensation. So not just uh, salary, but the value of equity. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to talk about your company's value proposition in a meaningful way. Those are the ways you win in this market. What is the most valuable of those that you just mentioned to candidates between salary, between equity, between work from home days? Yeah. What's the most valuable? So right now it's salary still. Um, that goes up and down in, in uh, tech hiring, uh, depending on sort of whether there's a boom or a bust cycle. I think at the end of a, what looks like a long boom cycle here, people are thinking about cash over equity. Um, remote working is really interesting, Taylor. So we've now got two thirds of our candidates on our platform want to work remotely. So that's a way a company can differentiate themselves and offer that to candidates and it doesn't cost them any extra dollars. Within tech, where is the biggest supply and demand disconnect? We're seeing it across tech, it's in software engineers, yeah. um, but we're seeing you know, areas like blockchain engineers, security engineers really explode. But you could look at all engineers, even DevOps backend engineers, uh, just demand is just vastly outstripping supply. So what do you tell employers? Do you tell them to maybe train more software engineers if they can't find these candidates externally, could they provide training services? Yeah. How do you close that gap? Well, first we tell them, and CEOs are already there, that their hiring funnel is as important as their revenue funnel. So they've got to think about how good they are at hiring. Secondly, we say, let's pay uh, you know, fair compensation and talk about your employer brand. And the third is diversify the pool, right? So look, particularly for engineers, for folks who might not have gone to the same universities or got the same degrees, but are self-taught and have great skills. And if you have a platform, our platform does this, where you can evaluate skills, not just where you've worked or, or how many years of experience you have, those are candidates that could be great for your job. So I'm trying to figure out at what age this problem starts to get solved. So let's say I graduated school and I didn't become a software engineer, but my kids perhaps would, would go to engineering school. What is that time frame? What generation would we start to see that solve the gap where now that we know that engineering is the future, everyone will go to engineering school? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics says there's three million shortage of jobs in tech over the next three years. So it's not going to get solved over the next three years. It is generational to your point. And I think it starts with, with middle school and high school teaching computer science. And you just get folks who are coming out, they might go off and get their English major in, in university, but they have the tech skills to get tech jobs should they want to. You mentioned blockchain, which piqued my interest a little bit. Is that a fad or here to stay? Looks like right now there's a lot of demand for it. I think people aren't sure what blockchain becomes, but it's such a uh, high demand skill set with low supply of people who have the skills that right now we're seeing that imbalance. Uh, it remains to be seen if it continues. Fascinating, that is hired CEO Mehul Patel. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining us. And it's still ahead, Guild Education is looking to leverage tech to get the workforce more schooling. Our conversation with CEO Rachel Carlson and investor Ken Shainault. This is Bloomberg.
We have some breaking news, and it looks like Alibaba is going to be launching their Hong Kong IBO, IPO. We do know that Alibaba is going to be offering some Hong Kong shares at no more than 188 Hong Kong dollars each. They're going to be setting their institutional offer price by November 20th, Hong Kong time. So again, Alibaba Group is launching their Hong Kong public offering at no more than about 188 Hong Kong dollars each. We will bring you more as we get details. Now, $1 billion, that is the value of Guild Education after closing $157 million in Series D funding led by General Catalyst. Guild Education works with employers, universities, and more to build education programs that will help their students avoid short or long-term debt. Along with the funding round, they announced that Ken Chenault, he's General Catalyst chairman and the former CEO of American Express, is joining Guild's board. Joining us now in Denver, it is Guild Education CEO Rachel Carlson and in New York, General Catalyst Chairman Ken Chenault. Thank you both for joining me. Rachel, let me just start with you. Remind our audience what Guild Education does. Thanks, Taylor. At Guild, we partner with leading employers like the Walt Disney Company, Walmart, and Discover Financial to connect education for their employees with the company's corporate strategy. We've done that by building a technology platform that enables companies to offer education to their employees and in partnership with the leading universities around the country to offer programs to the employees. It's a win-win for the employers who get to see benefits from recruitment, retention, and upskilling, and for the employees who get to head back to school debt-free. So, Ken, you're leading and helping this funding round. Uh, uh, what did you like in Guild that you couldn't get elsewhere? I think what's really important to us, Taylor, is we want to work with companies and founders who really want to drive powerful, positive change for our society. What is incredibly attractive about Guild is that it, one, has a mission to empower the workforce of America through education. And very importantly, it has tremendous economics. This is a software platform that has very high margins and has substantial growth opportunities. But I think what is absolutely exciting is this integration of a company that has very strong economics and growth potential and yet has the opportunity to transform workforce education in America. Rachel, you hear Ken talk about the tremendous economics of the company. What is your business model? How are you making money? Sure. So at Guild, we've taken a unique approach to aligning our margin and our mission. And we think that's really important for businesses in today's era to do. And it's why we're proud to be a B Corp. We're paid primarily by the universities who've replaced the large marketing budgets they used to have to spend on Google and Facebook to meet the frontline workforce of America and help them go back to school. And instead, when they save those dollars by meeting students through our employers, they pay for our technology and our services and keep some of the savings themselves. Ken, you know, we talk about this being a company that is female led and I wonder what has the pressure been in the last six, 12 months uh, to look at corporate governance, to be invested in female led companies as other companies, let's say WeWork had an all male board and that in part was why they weren't able to go public. I think what's very important is uh, I've had, I think, a very strong record of promoting and delivering on diversity and General Cat Catalyst shares this philosophy very strongly. I think it is very important that Guild Education is a female-led company and Rachel and her team have actually put together a very diverse team. It really is representative of what companies should be doing. And so from my standpoint, I believe that businesses and companies have to be more reflective of society overall. And we live in a very diverse society. And we are absolutely very focused on driving technology through the technology industry and business in general. 
So, Ken, you're joining the board day one. What's the first change you make at the board meeting? Here's what's very important that I believe. I have a high level of confidence in Rachel and her management team. And what I want to do is help Guild Education grow and transform education in this country. And we can do that with companies working hand in hand because we have in our roster, as Rachel can go through, Disney, Walmart, Discover, we have a range of companies that I think are at the forefront of innovation and trying to bring about change and succeeding in workforce education. Rachel Carlson of Guild Education and Ken Chenault of General Catalyst, thank you both for joining us. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology and Bloomberg Technology's live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.